Next, on the Paleo Way. My crew and I take an eye-opening trip to Australia's southern island of Tasmania to see how Cape Grim beef gets its international reputation. You're saying we should be focusing more on what they've been eating. Yeah. Our paleo ancestors were hunter-gatherers. Today, we'll be featuring food of the hunter. I don't think that you should cook something unless you can take its life. It's called nose to tail. I had an idea that organ meats were very nutrient-dense. I didn't know that they were that nutrient-dense. From duck eggs with asparagus and bone marrow with prof Professor Neil Mann. That's a primitive, healthy meal you've got there. To beef heart skewers with chimichurri sauce with acclaimed chef Gavin Baker. If you cook this for somebody and you just said it was steak, they wouldn't know the difference. From Cajun beef liver and avocado salad, livers like a multivitamin pill, to a lazy person's lamb, voted the best main meal by my highly discerning crew. You guys are going to try this. I'm Pete Evans, and this is the Paleo Way. So John, tell us where we are, mate. Well, we're at Staley in northwest Tasmania. We uh, farm about 1,100 grass-fed beef cattle here. We've got three breeds, the black ones, the Angus, uh -huh. the red ones, South Devon, and these guys are Murray Greys. So what's the difference in flavour? I don't think you'll find one. So let me get this straight. You're saying that we should be focusing more on what they've been eating than the actual breeds. Yeah. And what these beauties are eating is rich, lush grass. We're lucky in this area that the temperature ranges between about 12 degrees in the winter and 25 Celsius in the summer, and that allows us to grow good quality pasture for much of the year. So these cattle are fed good quality nutritional pasture for most of their life. And then John tells me something that took me by surprise. He and his fellow farmers don't consider themselves cattle ranchers, but rather... The producers in this area have learned to be grass farmers before cattle farmers and produce the best quality pasture they can, and that's reflected in the quality of the meat. Cows are ruminants. Yes. Yeah, Explain they, yeah. what a ruminant is. Well, they, they were evolved to eat grass. Grass is difficult to digest, so they, these guys do it very well. Like this guy here is chewing his cud. They, uh, they, they get a belly full of grass, and then they regurgitate it, grind it all up, and then they have four stomachs that the grass passes through to get the best nutrition from it. Now, you might not know this, but today, raising animals on pasture has become more the exception than the rule. Right after World War II, the United States had a surplus of urea, a nitrogen fertiliser used in bombs, so they decided to use it on corn. Then they had a surplus of corn and decided to feed it to cattle. It's like chalk and cheese. The animals themselves are not meant to eat grain. They're not designed for it. They're ruminant animals. So what happens to them? Well, number one, they're not healthy. They have problems digesting it. And when they do, they put on a lot of fat. And then we eat that and we become unhealthy. There seems to be a lot of correlation between the increase in intensive agriculture, the increase in use of antibiotics, the increase in use of hormones and therapies, the increase and feeding grain to an animal that can only really process grass. We started to see meat that was plentiful and cheap at the point of purchase, but there's a lot of science and evidence that right now says that actually it's not very cheap. We have a, a health issue with obesity, and, and I'm in that space myself. We have a health issue with antibiotic resistant bacteria, and then we have significant environmental issues in terms of runoff, in terms of water pollution. But there's a whole flip side of that coin that actually has exactly the opposite effect. Grazing animals, not uncoincidentally, evolved out on grasslands. Mm -hmm. Those two things co-evolved together for millions of years before we ever came along. And it turns out, if we use the grazing animal wisely, if we use it mimicking nature's own natural cycles, they're an integral part of actually improving the quality of the soil and of the plants that grow there. When you've got cattle like this eating these natural grasses, this is as close as we can get to the real situation with wild animals. I mean, we know cattle are domesticated. We've converted what their wild ancestors were into these docile creatures today. But one thing we can do to make them healthy and make us healthy 
is let them keep eating what their ancestors did, same as we should keep eating what our ancestors did, and that way they're healthy, we'll get healthy meat from them. So pastures and the grazing animals manhunted both saw to each other's evolutionary welfare. Now, in that same spirit, let's make a dish our hunter ancestors would be proud of. Now, Neil, I know you've done a lot of work about um, what's inside this bone here, so I thought I'd do a little dish here, which is bone marrow with asparagus and duck eggs. Eggs and asparagus just work really well together. The bone marrow become a very nutritious, healthy meal. Just got a bit of beef fat here, because mm -hmm. would you encourage people to experiment and, and get offal back into their diet? It's probably a wise idea rather than waste it, because a lot of nutrients are in the offal. We've been so used to now eating the protein-rich part and avoiding the offal foods full of DHA, one of the omega-3s. Got some asparagus? Right. Because we have to eat our vegetables. Absolutely. As you've Plenty told me. Now tell me about bone marrow because it is a wonder food. It is, and it's very primitive of you, Peter. When we come down out of the trees as primitive primates five million years or something ago and started wandering around in lush grassland rather than the forests and jungles, there wasn't much for us to eat. And what our ancestors had to do, and they didn't have very big brains to figure this out, is they found bones left over from the kills of big carnivores. They come along with a great big rock and smash the bones and the skulls up and scoop out the brain and scoop out the bone marrow. And that become a very big part of our staple diet for a long time. So you think this was part of our evolutionary process? Absolutely. We started eating marrow. It's mostly fat and water. Mm. And fat meant life, it meant energy, calories, as they say in mm. America. Mm. And that would be what they survive on. What we're gonna do is actually cook all this down in a bone broth, which is a, just a beef stock, basically. So yeah. lots of nutrients in there, oh, all sure extracted. There we have some toasted pine nuts. Mm -hmm. Nuts are good for us. I'm sure our ancestors ate a lot of those. And some capers, so a little bit of that that's going to give us some saltiness. And some fresh herbs and garlic, so... So we'll just season the broth, Neil. So some salt, some pepper. But this is it, this is as simple as the dish can get. I mean, eggs would have been a huge nutrient source for us as, oh, in our ancestral days. Absolutely, and not just birds' eggs, reptile eggs as well. Cooking it in the broth not only intensifies the flavour, but you get all this goodness, so it's nearly like a bit of a soup. The bone marrow has just started to melt a little. Just softened it ever so slightly. Yeah, that's a primitive, healthy meal you've got there. You've got virtually all your various vitamins and minerals. You've got fat, protein. The only thing you haven't got a lot of there is carbohydrate, which is what our ancestors didn't have a lot of mm. for a long, long time until agriculture. So. Oh, I'm flabbergasted to see someone in contemporary society take these ideas and then artistically combine it into a very, very healthy meal. That's amazing. Mm. You know what, Pete? You should be a chef. Hmm. Thanks, man. That tastes good. <laughs> you should be a professor. Oh, well, Smart man. <laughs> Coming up. It's beef heart. It's one of the most succulent, one of the most flavorful cuts you can have. You know, something I always say is you have to cook with love and laughter, but um, you also have to cook with heart. Ah, oh, Pete. Beautiful. If you're a hunter-gatherer out in the wild, your problem was getting enough energy to survive. I mean, there's no Maccas, there's no KFCs around the corner. You've got to find whatever you can to stay alive. So when they have an animal kill, they eat the offal first. The brain, the bone marrow, the liver, the kidneys, anywhere where there's fat. Yeah, they're the things in current society that we leave out yeah, of our diet. We tend to avoid. You needed high-energy foods to grow a bigger, high-energy brain. And there is no reason we can't eat those delicious high energy foods today. You just gotta know how to do it. I'm really thrilled because I'm about to cook with one of the world's most renowned chefs, Gavin Baker. Hi. Now, Gavin, I know that you've worked and spent a lot of time with indigenous tribes around the world. Most recently, say, in Indonesia, um, where you know we hunted and killed animals. Um, it's a different experience. It's far removed from what we're used to in the kitchen where things are delivered to us in boxes. It gives you sort of a sense of, you know, your cycle uh, in the process of life. What I understand from indigenous groups and primitive tribes is mm. they respect the whole animal. I mean, nothing goes to waste. That's true. And what was your experience like when you killed the wild boar, I think it was? It's gripping, you know. I don't think that you should cook something unless you can take its life. If you're truly a tribal member and you're living off the land, you have to kill to eat. So it deepens your connection with what you're eating. And you're gonna show us a recipe that, um, I won't say close to your heart. <laughs> <laughs> you can say that. Okay. It's beef heart. 
But we're going to turn this into a uh, South American chimichurri beef heart skewers cooked on the barbecue. The heart's one of the most succulent, one of the most flavorful cuts you can have. It's very nutritious as well. Sure. Do you want to show us how to uh, clean it up? There's quite a few bits and pieces on it. I think probably your best way to start is just sort of slice in half. Uh, oh, look at that. It's stunning. Trimming it up is really a simple matter. You're basically taking away the sinew. It's really quite as simple as just slicing yourself into chunks. Seriously, if you cook this for somebody and you just said it was steak, they wouldn't know the difference. They would say it was one of the best pieces of steak that they've ever had because it just melts in the mouth. It's stunning stuff. You can take all this fat off if you like. For our purposes, we shall. So while you're trimming that up, I'm going to make a chimichurri sauce. Really simple. Wonderful. Coriander and parsley, finely chopped. It's one of the most classic sauces, too. Well, what I love about the Argentinian cook is they embrace meat. Mm. I mean, everybody's got their own version of a chimichurri. Basically, it's a herb sauce, or what I call the South American pesto. It Except is. Except it doesn't have cheese or nuts in it. Well, I'm butterflying these out a little bit so that because we're going to cook them quite quickly. The thinner this is, the better off you are. Chili's next. So a little bit of cumin in with the herbs and the garlic. One of my favorite spices. Some salt. Splash of apple cider vinegar. Or you could use lemon juice or lime juice. The acid goes really well with the char from the grill. And some good quality extra virgin. Beautiful. On anything. I'm going to give that a bit of a stir. You can pop some in and then I'll pull it out. I mean, ideally, we'd let these sit for a good couple of hours and let them soak up all that right. delicious marinade. Look at that. I know as a young chef, I used to try to prove myself with lots of different techniques and yeah. different flavor combinations and everything. We all did, yeah. I think a sign of maturity as a chef is what they don't put on the plate. When you're talking about ingredients that are as good as something like this, you don't need much. A little bit of fire, some salt. Shall we go? Please. Caramelizing a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's the way to go. You know what? I think we're done. It doesn't take long. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Do you want to hit it with the pepper? Lovely. Maybe awesome. a bit more of that sauce. Yeah. Make some salt. Salt and some chili flakes. Absolutely. Oh, here we go. Bit of spice is nice. Yeah, it's hot. Can never go wrong. You know, something I always say is you're going to cook with love and laughter, but um, you also have to cook with heart. Ah, oh, Pete. Beautiful. That's as good as it gets, really. What more could you want? Except more. More. <laughs> more of these. Coming up. Look at that. Black and liver from the dirty, dirty. From the deep down, dirty, dirty of Tasmania. <laughs> <laughs> As they say in the hood. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
which is highly prized. Really clean tasting flavors to work with. I smell it straight away. Mm. And you want a bit of garlic on there too, don't you? A little crushed garlic. You don't even need to peel it. Okay, done. Flavors up that whole griddle. Show us how to uh, clean up this liver. Well, there's a lot of it. There's only three of us now to eat. <laughs> so that will be yours. Mm -hmm. So you can start pretty much anywhere you like on this. Again, with organ meats, there's not a lot of wrong in it. I'm hungry. While you're doing that, I'm going to make the Cajun mix up. Sure. Your recipe is some paprika. Smoked paprika. We've got some oregano. Cumin. Yep. Some chili. Some onion powder. Yep. We've got some garlic powder as well. Some thyme. And of course, some salt. Salt makes the world go around. We'll just give that a grind. Now, what do you do to that liver now? A little bit of lemon. It just brightens it up a bit. It also helps the uh, spices stick on. I love the look of that flesh. Mm. It's just so it's clean. Gorgeous, isn't it? I grew up with my mom cooking liver. She's English. She's English. So you had to cook it all the way through and then cook it again just to make sure it was cooked. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not going to do that today because with the liver, we want to keep it still a little bit pink inside. Uh, you can't go wrong. Yep. Look at this. And all we're doing here is just building flavor. Look at that. Yeah, stunning. Black and liver from the dirty, dirty. From the deep down, dirty, dirty of Tasmania. <laughs> <laughs> As they say in the hood. Yeah. <laughs> Get a little bit of the old toss and turn on it. And of course, you could do this spice mix with any cut of the meat. You could do it with the heart. You could do it with just a normal fillet. Yep, sirloin. Yep. So let's pop the liver on. Oh, that's what we want, that sizzle. And we should serve this with a little salad, hey? Yeah. Chili flakes. Yep. Maybe a few leaves of lettuce. It's nice to serve liver with a refreshing salad on the side because it helps cut through that richness. There we go. And put some thyme leaves in there as well. Oh, beautiful. Fresh herbs. Herbs? Herbs. I always get in trouble because I say herbs. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got to slice this liver into a few pieces. There we go. Look at that liver. Look at that. Just, yeah. just like butter. Very attractive. It's oh, really yeah, that's cooked. So that's what we're after, sort of medium rare. Stunning. Mm. 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 Just melts it. in the mouth, isn't it? Yeah, look at that. That's exactly yeah. how we want it cooked. Mm. It's very creamy, too. Are you a liver fan? I am now, for sure. That's good, because we got a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up, it's Lazy Man's lamb shoulder. Lazy Man? You can use whatever's in the fridge. Doesn't matter what it looks like. <laughs> Anyone can do this, is yeah, that what you're saying? Exactly. Pretty thrilled to have Dominic O'Neill here from Grassroots Urban Butchery, or Grub, as he's decided to call his butchery. Now, Dom, tell me how you got started in this. Well, people, I got frustrated not being able to find good food. What do you mean by good food? Everything has to be grass-fed and grass-finished. Free-range, grass-fed beef, grass-fed lamb, free-range pork. Well, I like the idea of this. We've got two chopping boards here, so... Um... It's Lazy Man's lamb shoulder. Lazy Man? This recipe, you can use whatever's in the fridge. Doesn't matter what <laughs> it looks like. Anyone can do this, is yeah. that what you're saying? Exactly. Because you're slow cooking, it's going to be beautiful. Well, let's get started. Okay. Now, tell us about this lamb. What do you got here? We've got a beautiful grass-fed and finished lamb shoulder. We're going to score the fat. So why do you score it? it gets the flavours right into the meat there so you really get your hands dirty okay so and then we're going to rub some cumin in there some salt you can put a bit of pepper in there any other flavors you want i mean you can use rosemary so you really get your hands dirty this is good for the kids the kids love getting in there yep do you cut the fat off no nah, i i love fat i mean i get most of my calories from fat so i'll do the garlic and i'll start on the onion carrots now you got some of your um, famous tallow here, which is um, beef yeah, fat. It's beef fat, yeah. So we get whole carcasses in. We try not to waste anything because we want to use the whole animal. The, the farmer has gone to a lot of trouble to produce this, so we want to use it all. And cooking in animal fats is so healthy. It's so much better for you. From the right animal? From Exactly. It's got to be a grass-fed and grass-finished animal. Throw it all in. Yep. Brown the onions and the garlic. Red onion the same? Yeah, rough. just rough. Yeah, of course, mate. Rough. Yeah. I like this, man. <laughs> Lazy man's lamb shoulder. So we've got a little, 
little bit of cumin. So cumin seed? Yeah, cumin seed or you can ground it, but you know, it's lazy man, so. Then we add some beef stock. So again, with all the bone, we make our own stock. Everything We don't want to waste anything. Tomatoes, carrots, anything is going to be good. We just throw the lamb straight on top, put the lid on, and let the oven do the rest. Okay, so what temperature? 90 degrees for about 10 to 12 hours. Love it. Well, luckily we put one in yesterday, mate, because <laughs> otherwise we would have been standing here for 12 hours. Smelling good. Days. Yeah, hello. Hello. <laughs> You just gotta eat food, real food. That's the I love secret. that. Just eat real food. Mate, this is real. We've even had 20 year vegans starting to shop with us, being introduced into meat again, and, and it's great. I love it. It falls away. And don't be afraid of the fat. Eat the fat. What do you call this? Lazy man. Lazy man's lamb shoulder. So much flavour. Mm. You guys gotta try this, come on. Before, before there's none left. You wanna pop in the sauce? Very pretty. Rob, come in, mate. That's the dish of the series, I reckon. Mm.